just for inviting me here. And uh, I think this is uh, my learning opportunity from you. So after uh, this, uh, we can talk to each other and then get some idea. As Dr. Bedikian said, that uh, there is no miracle system chemotherapy. So that is a dilemma for the adjuvant treatment. Because usually adjuvant, breast cancer or lung cancer, or any adjuvant is based on the uh, medicine which is already worked for the stage four disease. So we didn't, f hadn't found it. So therefore, now we found who is going to have high risk, and then there's a significant dilemma. But uh, at least a couple of medicine uh, might be, uh, you know, interesting to study, like a uh, uh, histone DSHS inhibitor. And we are doing, uh, we're going to, we might do the student trial on a short basis. But again, uh, Dr. Bedekian's group working very hard. Uh, for example, IGF-1 receptor blockade uh, may work, and then CTL-4 antibody may work for stage 4 disease. Maybe uh, we can try uh, the, uh, that kind of medicine on a natural basis to see. Uh, it's kind of a little long way to go, but uh, I want to just make you understand that we are not sleeping. We are working very hard. <laughs> <laughs> so my role here is to uh, summarize the uh, available uh, so-called liver-directed treatment. And uh, I, uh, Dr. Bedekian had a nice presentation regarding systemic disease, systemic uh, treatment, but uh, uh, nothing is working on a very at a high rate. So therefore, the uh, issue is how we can control the liver metastasis, which is dominant in most of patients. I have no more conflict to disclose. <coughs> And uh, to make you understand the uh, uh, way of thinking, uh, I just make a summary of the algorithm here. So uh, if a patient comes uh, with metastasis, uh, first we evaluate the, the patient condition. And uh, if patient uh, come to us at the very late stage, and uh, usually their prognosis is uh, very poor. Uh, in fact, uh, when I uh, joined uh, Jefferson uh, uh, 20, almost 20 years ago, uh, the median survival uh, after coming to the university is two months. So that was true uh, as uh, Dr. Gregorius reported with the any treatment. So uh, most of the uh, liver directed treatment show the approximately one year survival right now. So, uh, and then uh, the technology to discover the tumor at the early stage is also advanced. Therefore, probably we should just add six months, like the time bias. But still, uh, the, any trial which showed more than one year survival, I believe, uh, is beneficial to the patient. So, but uh, in, uh, sometime, uh, sometime we have patients who have sign of liver failure, such as edema on the legs, swelling of the abdomen, the jaundice, this type of patient, unfortunately, has a, a benefit from getting any type of treatment. Therefore, we have to seriously discuss hospice care or other alternative care. But some patients want to do something, so we try something that is not going to harm the patient, but uh, it's kind of difficult. That's the reason for the early discovery. So if you are uh, intentionally or you try to change the outcome, uh, you should come to the doctor at the very early stage. So that is a rationale in doing a uh, liver uh, image. And there is separates uh, you know, population patient whom we see, not every day, but in a very rare occasion. If patient come with a single lung metastasis, uh, we call spread as a metastasis. You know. So only one lesion, or if uh, we only see one lesion in the liver, and then if patient has very long time to uh, discover metastasis, we confirm that a surgical approach might be beneficial. But the majority of cases come within two years or three years of diagnosis. And uh, if you go to the surgeon, surgeon is very confident in taking care of something. So they say, okay, I'm going to cut it out. What they found is multiple tiny children. And then still they don't give up. Just cut it out, they give all kind of radio frequency ablation, cryo ablation, and the uh, patients suffer from that. Also, in within a couple months, uh, they have a bad news again. So therefore, uh, probably better to avoid uh, aggressive surgical intervention if time to systemic regulation is less than five years. So that is our experience, and the majority of cases uh, we see the recurrence very quickly. 
But in rare occasion, uh, if it is single lesion, a long time from the diagnosis, especially if the patient doesn't want to have any aggressive treatment, uh, nowadays uh, we could do the radiofrequency needle ablation you know, or instead of surgery. Sometimes, uh, nowadays, uh, we can focus the beam radiation like a cryosurgery. That might be beneficial uh, if uh, that's only one or two uh, single metastases. But the majority of the case uh, come uh, with multiple liver disease. And uh, that uh, developed the meta patient developed metastasis within a couple of years. And then the uh, surgeon uh, won't get in, but we usually say don't do it because we know the outcome. In this type of patient, we know that uh, liver uh, treatment is not curative, but uh, I'm pretty sure we can just uh, stop the growth in two thousand of patients. So therefore, uh, we are going to work with the patient to uh, stop the growth in the liver. So what we should do in that case, uh, we are talking about uh, this uh, liver is a dominant metastatic site. If a patient uh, has multiple lung lesions and liver is only one or two, I think uh, they have a time to go into systemic uh, treatment, such as clinical trial. But at the most of the case, a uh, patient comes with liver dominant disease, and then only a couple of tiny lung, disease, lung metastasis or uh, bone metastasis. It is a majority of cases, I would say 70-80%. In that case, uh, liver directed treatment, we believe, uh, is a way to go and potentially a from uh, the survival. And then uh, if after uh, liver treatment or after system treatment, only a couple of regions are less, uh, left for oligometastasis, uh, there is a new approach such as uh, radio frequency aberration over stereotactic radio surgery. So this is a way uh, that you can think. And this is kind of different schema, uh, table. Uh, and uh, we have a kind of restaurant menu. So and then actually, interventional radiologists can explain everything, but. Uh, uh, we prefer uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we like the small disease, to be honest with you. Large uh, metastasis, a big uh, multiple metastasis, it's very tough to treat. But uh, if a uh, patient has smaller metastasis, there are many ways. If you see the less than 20% involvement liver, any kind of treatment is, uh, you know, appropriate. And the problem is that there is no head-to-head -head comparison. So therefore, okay, Dr. Sato, which would you choose? Uh, it's kind of very complicated addition-making process. But uh, again, there's no uh, comparison uh, between, for example, uh, uh, liver infusion, uh, various uh, embolization, such and such. So, but if the tumor is very big, usually uh, surgery or radio frequency ablation is not applicable. And uh, we found that uh, our new approach, immunoembolization, is not going to help at all. Uh, because much more toxic uh, if we treat the large tumor. <coughs> and then radiosphere, uh, we need some t uh, t t treatment. Uh, radiosphere is not going to work well. So in the uh, big challenges, a uh, patient who has big tumor, a multiple tumor in both lower liver, and uh, we might have to uh, choose the chemoembolization or uh, drug eluting beads that I'm going to explain. This is like a general uh, kind of a example how we choose. So why uh, we choose a uh, uh, hepatic artery as a uh, root of treatment? Uh, because the liver cancer, especially metastasis, tend to have a majority of the blood flow from the hepatic artery. So uh, at the same time, a uh, healthy liver has dominant flow from portal vein. It's a different uh, blood vessels. So therefore, if we cut the blood supply uh, into the hepatic artery, we can potentially uh, preferentially kill the, the cancer in the liver. And then why we can preserve some portion of LCE liver because uh, they have blood supply from portal vein. So uh, then uh, we can give a higher dose of treat, um, chemotherapy medicine or immunological uh, into the liver uh, while our system treat uh, toxicity is much less. So this is a, a rationale in uh, giving uh, the liver-directed treatment. Uh, again, a patient uh, should have the liver-dominant disease with uh, access from the hepatic artery. So this is a kind of uh, 
you know, uh, very difficult to explain everything, but uh, basically what we are going to do is, first of all, we should talk to the patient, uh, interventional radiologist examine the patient, sometimes we involve the radiation for this, uh, for the radio sphere treatment. Mm -hmm. But after a patient uh, decided on uh, the liver directed treatment, uh, we keep the patient in the hospital to start from the IV fluid. And then uh, interventional radiologists give a, a, a prophylactic uh, anti-emetic, uh, anti nausea medicine, and then they give a medicine to uh, make the patient feel comfortable, uh, but uh, not totally sedated. So then they first uh, give a diagnostic uh, uh, an uh, the an angiography to see whether they can give medicine or not. And then nobody has the same anatomy, so therefore, you know, somebody has an artery from different areas, so therefore they have to get into this basic area. <coughs> and during the procedure, uh, we give a, a medicine a through the hepatic artery, and then uh, usually we mix the uh, uh, chemotherapeutic medicine or immunological medicine with the uh, uh, oily contrast uh, ethanol uh, to make the uh, medicine stay, staying in the liver longer. And after that, uh, we uh, usually stop the blood flow by the uh, either permanent or transient occlusive. So what we call it embol chemo embolization, immunoembolization. If we use a, a radioactive microsphere, we call it radio embolization. And patients usually stay one night for the hydration because they sometimes uh, that causes liver injury, sometimes causes kidney injury. So we have to keep giving IV fluid. And then uh, we do the antiprophylactic antibiotics to avoid liver infection. And the pain control is the main issue. Uh, we have to learn, patients have to learn, family have to learn how to use the pain medicine uh, uh, in an appropriate way. And patients uh, tend to develop nausea, so we just keep uh, nausea medicine in the hospital. And uh, the fact is, uh, we use, we have uh, four, more than 400 procedures per year just for eye melanoma, liver metastasis, and then 95% uh, patients just stay one night. And then more than uh, three third, uh, two third of the patient uh, flying in and flying out. So therefore, this is a relatively easy or less invasive approach, but still have some complications, so we have to manage it. Uh, and the major complication is fever, uh, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, and any kind of you know, post embolic syndrome uh, can develop, but uh, usually manageable by the pain medication. And then uh, relatively rare, but uh, very uh, toxic, uh, uh, complication is so-called tumor lysis syndrome. If uh, this treatment is not chemotherapy itself, just a mechanical killing of cancer by cutting blood supply, so therefore sometimes we kill too, too many tumors. So that could cause the uh, disruption of the tumor cell and then end up in a kidney failure. So therefore we have to give the uh, IV fluid uh, very vigorously, and sometimes we use a medicine for polypurinol to protect the kidney. Uh, the old uh, kind of procedure in the, in the uh, uh, manual and the computer system. And then we have, we only lost one patient over the 10 years, more than 2,000 kind of procedures. So uh, actually, Dr. Bedikian group has been involved uh, because this uh, chemoembolization is uh, first uh, reported from M. Anderson in the United States for uvia melanoma. The beginning, uh, they use a cisplatinum, and then uh, we use a BCNU. Uh, summary: uh, some, uh, you know, yesterday Dr. Ashman showed the uh, summary of the old result. But uh, basically, uh, up to 30% patient has some type of type of response, either shrinkage uh, or total disappearance. Uh, total disappearance is relatively rare for the embolization procedure. And then uh, one third of the patient has stable disease uh, for several months. And the one third of the patient has progression. That's a kind of general summary. And then uh, in Europe, uh, they don't embolize it. Uh, they use the uh, chemo infusion to the hepatic artery, such as photomastin or carboplatin. But these uh, uh, carboplatin studies are very promising result, but the uh, result uh, number is very small, so we don't know. So. And then, um, and then again, uh, isolated liver perfusion that Dr. Asherman mentioned yesterday. Uh, it has been uh, uh, catheter uh, uh, liver perfusion that has been done in the United States, but it's not approved yet, just only approved in the, uh, uh, Europe. So I will just show you the, uh, the, our uh, new approach at Jefferson. We uh, try to make a vaccine in the tumor, in the liver, 
So cut the blood supply and then killing a cancer and after injecting an immunological. And, and then we use a GM shed cell, new kind. Uh, this stimulates the macrophage index cell. And then uh, we, we try to start from the phase one study. This is hopefully work. It's a hepatic artery. You can put the tube in and then give a medicine, the same for chemo and immunembo, and then put the, uh, close the artery. And then after that, medicine uh, and the embolization induce uh, so-called inflammation. And then uh, recruit uh, many uh, uh, so-called antigen presenting cell. And then uh, that uh, is going to stimulate the immune system. Uh, it's kind of really slow. I'm maybe running out of time. Uh, this is so-called antigen presenting cell. Then uh, this cell is going to move to the uh, local lymph node and educate T cell. And then once uh, it is successful, uh, the T cell can attack on the, the uh, tumor in the remote uh, area. So this is the result. Uh, top uh, is a, a pre, and down is a, a post. Uh, we see the uh, shrinkage of the tumor in one side of the patient. And sometimes patients have remote metastasis, like a skin metastasis. Uh, we see significant infiltration of the immune cell into the uh, tumor. So based on that, uh, we did a, a phase two study uh, comparing uh, immunoembolization and preembolization. Uh, this is going to be a long story, but the uh, 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 result is uh, this uh, immunoembolization uh, has some beneficial uh, benefit uh, in the patient who has uh, 20 to 50 percent of the liver replacement. And smaller uh, pa patient who has smaller disease, plain embo has a significant prolongation of life. So therefore, we don't know if the dose is okay or not. So we have to work on uh, the different kind of clinical trial. So there are three different clinical uh, approaches: uh, uh, drug eluding bees and uh, so-called radio sphere uh, study is a treatment as a clinical study at Jefferson. And hepatic perfusion, uh, IHP, PHP, I think Dr. Ashman uh, talked yesterday, uh, is uh, done, uh, and they're waiting for the, the approval. The only uh, the surgical uh, hepatic perfusion is available in this country. So I think I'm running out of time, so I just... Can I just, why don't you finish up your last... Keep moving? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, thank you very much. <laughs> so this is a drug eating base. Uh, we know we have a more primitive approach, cutting a blood supply and then give a medicine. And so all medicine pass through quick. Uh, this uh, base contain the uh, medicine, uh, and then uh, beads stuck in the liver because size. So therefore, this is a permanent operation give a significant ischemic attack on the cancer. At the same time, medicine such as uh, doxorubicin or uh, inotecan is going to release uh, in the liver at a uh, very uh, constant speed. <coughs> so the first study was pre uh, published from Italy. The Italian people is always excellent. They say 100% response rate by using a CPT level inotecan. So this is a colon cancer medicine, but how they choose it, I don't know. But the inotecan is approved for the uh, colon cancer uh, treatment uh, by peace. So this is one of those studies that we might need to follow. And then in this, uh, in this country, uh, we have a clinical trial using a different chemotherapy medicine, uh, doxorubicin. So for the DevDox uh, treatment, uh, this is one of the patients who participate in clinical trial. On the left, uh, you see the tumor. On the right, uh, tumor disappears. And at the same time, you see some uh, low, low density area. This is uh, atrophy, atrophy, shrink This is like a bomb. Just I will kind of throwing a bomb and kill cancer. At the same time, some certain damage the liver. But uh, we learn how to manage it right now. So this patient has no uh, uh, treatment for almost one year. It's a complete response after DevDox. Uh, this is a, a DevDox plus. Okay, you see the uh, a big tumor here, and this is DevDox uh, followed by standard chemo so significant uh, regression of the cancer. But it's toxic, uh, you know, we have to manage the pain, and, but uh, again, no, gain, no pain, no gain. <laughs> We're going to give a patient who has big tumor, and then we just kind of throw the bone and kill it. But uh, we can continue this because of damage, like uh, IHP. 
some uh, aggressive treatments are available, but we carefully choose the patients. And this is radio sphere treatment. Instead of chemotherapy medicine, like a radio plug, throw the bees, uh, it's a different size, smaller size, with radioactive uh, uh, particles, so called yttrium 19. So uh, we are doing a, a clinical trial uh, for the patient who have no previous uh, treatment in the liver or a patient who has mm-hmm. one previous uh, chemoembolization in embolization. So this is a little bit uh, time consuming because uh, radiology, intervention radiology have to cut all kind of blood supply to the other organs first, so-called flow study. And then uh, if all uh, blood flow are directed to the liver, and then we can release the uh, radioactive microsphere. And this is one example. Uh, they see multiple uh, dot. This is a PET scan that doctor. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, there's no activity after this. So, this uh, again, uh, this uh, study was done as a like a rescue treatment, like salvage. Uh, we are conducting whether this is better than standard uh, other uh, immunoembolization, chemoembolization. Let's compare and just skip it. Uh, this uh, mentioned by doctor. Uh, Ashanon yesterday, uh, there is a uh, excellent response by this treatment, so called the isolated liver perfusion. So I cannot ignore that, uh, but we haven't done this because of, uh, because we have many other treatments. <laughs> and then, uh, and this is very toxic treatment, and then, you know, well, if a patient fails to this treatment, I can't do anything else. So we try not to go this route, but uh, again, this is also very promising, and, but the toxic. And I'm just uh, show. Uh, I'm, my role is just talking. So I have a team behind me. <laughs> so interventional radiologist and then uh, you know radiation oncologist behind me. And this is my collaborators. Thank you very much. I think those are some really great summaries talking about treatment for metastatic uveal melanoma. And I know I had a question that I'd maybe like you guys to address uh, quickly, which, you know, one of my questions is I think for ophthalmology, you know, the technology has advanced pretty quickly so that we can do this biopsy and we can kind of stratify people into a high risk and a lower risk. And, you know, and it's frustrating because we don't have a lot of adjuvant trials to offer patients. And that's very, very frustrating. And I'd like uh, maybe the panel to talk about, you know, why don't we have more adjuvant trials? What are some of the challenges? And um, what should we look for in terms of adjuvant trials in the future? I already uh, answered that question, but uh, there is no effective system in chemotherapy. Uh, there is no effective uh, like a signal blockade right now. So, but uh, I hope that in within five years, I'm hopeful that we see better uh, medicine to use for the adjuvant basis. But meanwhile, uh, your technology advanced much quicker. Yeah. So, and then uh, there is a potentially two clinical trials. Uh, yesterday mentioned uh, Dr. Herbert's group went on to the uh, histone dehydrogenase inhibitor, extract inhibitor trial, probably with public acid. So that might be open sometime, hopefully in one year. And then we are uh, giving a SNP on a very selected uh, patient basis. This is a clinical trial. We have a very long discussion, and then if patient want to do it and the insurance cover it, uh, we uh, give the sunitinib on a management basis for six months. But uh, uh, we have some preliminary good results, so we are moving to the more official clinical study in the near future. So, therefore, uh, as of today, these two are available in this country. Also, uh, um, you mentioned a couple uh, treatment at uh, uh, Quinlan Clinic. And then uh, Dr. Mahri is good. Uh, melanoma as a, uh, as a disease differs from other tumor types because uh, it, it has uh, many pathways for growth and spread. Uh, we are identifying these pathways now so that we can identify targets. In a skin melanoma, whereby we have when from, from Rafael, that got approved last year, uh, we have seen that uh, even though that disease has effective single agent treatment that causes shrinking half the patient, after initial response, the tumor comes back using another pathway. So in uveal melanoma, we have already identified three different pathways for growth and spread. 
So we need to identify effective drugs so that we can come with rationally designed combinations that will prevent the other pathway being used to bypass the pathway that uh, the blood that we are putting with these drugs. So we need to identify effective drugs along these different pathways first to come with the combinations. If we, if we give one drug treatment, it's not likely to work because, as I as mentioned in case of skin melanoma, we have seen patients having very good initial response and then tumor grows back again using another pathway. And another thing that's very important is that we need to biopsy the tumor before treatment, two weeks or three weeks into the treatment with the target therapy, and when the tumor grows back again, that will tell us if the drug we are giving, blocking the pathway first, and then when your tumor is growing back, which pathways are being used by the tumor cell to bypass the blood, so that we can come with rational design combinations. Um, I don't know if I have anything to add uh, specifically. I mean, I think one of the big things is, um, in ophthalmology at least, uh, Clinical trials are often driven by a company who has something to sell. So they have a drug, and they want to have a trial, and they pay you money to do it. Uh, money makes things happen, and um, it's hard to have a clinical trial if nobody's making any money. So, and, and I think that goes to the point earlier about watching your bills if you're participating in a clinical trial. A lot of the newer designs employ quasi-standard of care, comparing two standard billable standard of care procedures against each other, and then it, in which case it's just covered as a routine medical expense done in a systematic way. But to run these studies, you need study coordinators, and they're not cheap. And so, the frank answer is unless a lot of paperwork. Oh, it's just huge. So if, if you, it, 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 ideally you would have a drug company saying, hey, we've got this great drug for uveal melanoma, and we want you guys to test it. I don't know, does that work for you guys? Is that how, you were talking about stealing your drugs from your cutaneous melanoma patients. <laughs> Uh, to, to, be, to be honest with you, none of the, uh, the drug companies are interested in investing in real melanoma. And as I said, the, the, the clinical trials that I listed before, I have worked on every single one at least five years. I have done two or three different clinical trials in skin melanoma before I got the commitment to give additional free drug for real melanoma. Uh, it's an orphan disease. They, they are not going to make money out of it. They don't want to spend money into it. And uh, for that reason, it's uh, so, uh, uh, so easy to get frustrated. But if you are persistent at the end, you win. I can tell you that because they come to me to do those clinical trials. I do those clinical trials for them when they want me to. But once I have done this, the quality of work we do, then I have the leverage on them when they come a second time. So I said, Either, either you give for, for this, or we do, we'll not keep doing it. We'll participate. And that's how we get those dogs. Are, are patients often charged? Are patients charged in these clinical trials? Do the charges go to the patients? Or do the companies? Well, the, 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 there are se several kinds of clinical trials. I don't need it. There are several kinds of clinical trials. There are clinical trials whereby the company agrees to give free drug. So the, the, the patient's insurance will be charged for mixing, administration, clinic visit, and the test you do. There are, there are other clinical trials whereby the company gives the money for the research nurse and everything else, <coughs> but patient insurance will be covering for the other costs. So if, if I have a PI-initiated therapy, a principal investigation trial, I have to manage the money for my research nurse, the coordinator, all that accessory, which cost about $100,000, through other donations that I receive to support uh, doing the clinical trial. But the uh, insurance company has to cover the clinic visits, the pharmacy cost, mixing of the drug administration, those things, and the scale. So I guess I want to know, how much money are we talking here? How much money do you need? Because I'm not, I'm serious. Okay, so Oprah doesn't have this, so we're not going to get a celebrity to give any money, and we're not going to have a telethon. But, you know, as a patient community, I think we're pretty proud, powerful, and we're pretty motivated. So, I mean, we all know 100 people on Facebook. If 100 people give $100, you know, it adds up. So how much money do you need for a trial like this? Hey, 
for targeted therapy clinic, uh, clinic visit, for example, when we have a targeted drug, targeted drug uh, initial biopsy costs about $500 to know whether the patient has got the mutation we are after. Okay, after we identify two weeks into the treatment, we have to check to see the treatment is actually blocking that pathway. That's the second biopsy. When the patient grows back again, we have to take it to see which pathway is being used. Insurance will not pay for this. They said it's pure research. We are not interested in this. So we have to find a way to subsidize the cost. And that comes from donations that we receive from patients that we have treated 10, 15 years ago. They are still alive, doing functioning very well. And then they, we you know, solicit a, a donation from them and support the new research we are doing. That's the only way. But do you have a number in mind? I, I mean, I'm serious. How, how much for money? For one clinical trial, the age that inhibitor he was mentioning, we calculated we need $450,000 to do that clinical trial. That's good. I'm sorry, I think that's that That's one, one drug. And we have identified 10 different targets already Maybe. in your real melanoma. I have a question. Are there countries that are not run by the FDA or NICE or whatever the opinion on is? Where, where basically the cost for the drug company is much lower to develop something. So where orphan drugs are being researched, uh, maybe our, our type of drug that we need to also be researched? Uh, the, the, well, you have to keep in mind we are three years, four years ahead of Europe in many of these clinical trials. No, with well, drug. What I mean is you could do medical tourism. For patients, it doesn't matter that it's in another country. What I'm wondering is, are there orphan drugs being developed right now in countries where there's not all this red tape and extra costs? Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that in Southeast Asia it's, it's happening. Right? No. They, they, they are not doing clinical trials with, with, with the, the way we do. Uh, I can tell you the story of Fotemustin. I was interested in Fotemustin almost 15 years ago. And uh, the clinical trials were done. They proved that to, to, to be effective in Europe. The, the one of the, the drug companies wanted to buy the drug to make it available over here. They went to the FDA, FDA said, we have to repeat the phase two phase clinical trial to prove efficacy before we approve. And the company looked, it will cost me about $200, $200 million to run those studies when I'm not going to recoup the money. Why should I? That's not what I mean. Profit, yeah. What I mean is that if we as a patient go to that country where the FDA has no say, the cost goes boom down a lot. If we could do clinical trials there and even treatments in those countries, we, we would have an opportunity to basically make it more interesting financially for the drug companies. We just tell them, we'll go to wherever you have the drug available, not specifically the US. But US. somebody should, should, uh, should take care of the uh, medical care costs. Who's going to pay for it? Well, but if the cost is much lower, it becomes more affordable. I don't know and about the financing that. will be easier. We're looking at the wrong thing. We're looking at the American price or the European price. Yeah. That's not the price that will be in those countries. It's way uh, less. Yes, if you, if you have faith in the quality of care given there, then that's fine. Uh, but I don't think that it really works that way. I think this gentleman is looking for a cure for the FDA. I don't think <laughs> no, I'm looking for a way around the FDA. I would like to answer the question from this young lady who is trying to find out what she would have to pay. The trials that Hello? I looked at, you, you very rarely have to pay anything. If you get out. That you can join and pay for your own medication. I was invited to join a year boy trial, and um, I talked to Bristol Meyer. They have a system whereby they will, if you cannot afford it, they will discount seriously. But if you can afford it, they will charge you $120,000 per eight or 12 week cure. Uh, uh, that is that if you are at a three, um, uh, three gram per kilogram weight. If you go to 10 grams, it's going to be about $160,000 if you can afford it. If you can't afford it, they will discount it Seriously, so it'll cost Well, I think stress. what specifically what I was talking about, I'm not talking about individual costs for me or a patient to participate in a trial. I'm talking about trial. nobody, there's, there's not a drug company out there that can, that's going to do uh, reap any financial benefits from 
having the trial in the first place. So let's raise the money to pay for the trial to begin with. That's what I'm talking about. I, just, I mean, we just, we just in, in a month, in 30 days, we raised 20, almost $15,000 for a play about Akiomelanoma. I mean, and that's just, you know, that 300 people in my own community. I, I think it's possible if you're motivated. We're putting you in charge. <laughs> it can happen. It can happen. Nationwide. <laughs> I would just also make uh, one, one other quick comment, too, that, um, you know, in terms of other countries, may, you know, we may not, they may, may not be as susceptible to eye melanoma in those countries, mm -hmm. so there's very low numbers, mm -hmm. maybe in some other countries, and there are also some other ethical considerations of, you know, doing these studies when it may be, you know, not done in the best way. And I, I have no so. ethical consideration when it's about my life. Me first. We can do, or you can do, is just try to raise your voice to the couple places. Mm -hmm. you know, FDA is one thing. The other thing is a pharmaceutical company. And actually, uh, as you know, majority of melanoma clinical trial exclude Nivea melanoma. For example, we have a cancer vaccine trial you know, from the mage protein, and the eye melanoma is excluded. So that kind of a, you know, a tendency if uh, you say as a foundation, okay, we do uh, support some portion, portions of the apple, could you provide the medicine for your charge to one of the investigators? So that might be the way to go. And then uh, usually uh, in, uh, investigator initial clinical trial costs like $15,000 per patient with a venture. So that's kind of a cost that you can see. I would just make one other comment too. Um, that I would also consider talking to your Congress representative, or you know, some, letters, some letters too about because you know, as our research dollars are cut, we're going to be able to do less and less research. So I think that's another avenue that I'd also work for. A question over here. Yeah, is there is there a difference in a tumor in the liver that was a secondary tumor to the primary ocular melanoma? versus uh, a tumor in the liver that's the primary tumor or that's a secondary tumor from some other form of primary cancer? Because, does it, it, so it's a two-part question. So is there a difference there? And then second, if there's not, then doesn't, shouldn't the research fall under the research in, cl in clinical trials for the generic liver tumor treatment? Metastasis. Met metastasis, right. Great question. Your question is the liver metastasis from uvia melanoma is same <coughs> from colon cancer liver metastasis? That goes to liver. I think there's a few the question I think I would say is are they similar enough? Are the tumors that are in the liver similar enough that we could have group all liver tumors together uh, or maybe all metastatic liver tumors together and do trials on those numbers? Uh, probably the answer is probably close to no. <laughs> and but uh, there is, the, for example, uh, ablation. In other words, uh, like radioactive uh, microsphere treatment, basically shoots the you know beads to the liver. So therefore, whenever a tumor has tendency to have blood supply from hepatic artery, mm -hmm. this is a general consensus that we can use hepatic artery to shoot to treat. But on the other hand, uh, if uh, you know uh, you are uh, talking about detail about, for example, molecular signaling or you know, some targeting one specific molecule. For example, insulin growth factor one receptor uh, is dominant in liver metastasis from eye melanoma, and liver is producing growth factor. So that's the reason for uh, our clinical trial, IMCHL, to just cut the circuit. So that is more liver uh, metastasis, eye melanoma, liver metastasis specific approach. So, and then long answer, uh, short answer is probably difficult in using whole group as a group, as a one entity. But uh, for individual treatment, maybe. Are there? Uh, okay. Are there any clinical trials involving um, metastatic ocular melanoma uh, and uh, metastatic colorectal melanoma? Same time. Yeah. Uh, we don't see the simultaneous uh, metastasis frequently, okay? 
And in general, uh, if you have second malignancy or uh, concurrent malignancy, uh, you cannot participate. So therefore, majority of clinical trials on this single cancer type. Okay. And then I think part of his question is uh, a primary eye and liver is the same. Probably uh, some most aggressive part of the eye melanoma is growing in the liver based on the uh, chemokine receptor or some in, I know, or affinity to the liver and growth factor. And then uh, again, most of these three patients uh, tend to uh, grow more rapidly compared to Dyson in three. In Dyson in three patients can grow the liver. Yeah, we, we have submitted a paper looking at liver metastases and looking at the genetics of them. And particularly, monosomy 3 was found with the, the patients who did not survive long with those metastatic tumors, whereas the metastatic tumors that had more of a normal chromosome 3 seemed to survive longer. So it might be something helpful for maybe future clinical trials. Okay, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. This was a really great session, and maybe we can continue uh, later outside. Thank you, everybody.